Tuesdays. Tonight at 10, Donald Trump faces the most serious allegations to beset his presidency so far. He's accused of asking former FBI boss James Comey to halt the investigation into links between his former national security adviser and Russia. Donald Trump hasn't yet responded directly to the latest allegations against him, but he is defiant. No politician in history, and I say this with great surety, has been treated worse or more unfairly. As pressure intensifies on the president, he is facing growing criticism from within his own party. I think we've seen this movie before. I think it's reaching the point where it's of Watergate size and scale. After the turbulence of the first few months, we'll be asking how serious a moment this is for the Trump presidency. Also tonight, the Liberal Democrats launched their election manifesto, pledging another referendum on any Brexit deal. Meanwhile, new measures to curb immigration are understood to be among the pledges in the Conservatives' manifesto launched tomorrow. A record number of people in work, but there are more warnings of a squeeze on living standards. And the fight against digital propaganda, the millions of fake profiles created on social media, pumping out misinformation. Coming up in Sports Day later in the hour on BBC News, there's so much at stake in the championship as Sheffield Wednesday and Huddersfield look to reach the playoff final to face Reading. Good evening. President Trump is facing what his critics say are the most serious allegations to beset his presidency so far. He has been accused of trying to get the former head of the FBI, James Comey, who he sacked last week, to drop an investigation into links between his former national security adviser and the Russians. The claims have prompted a small but growing number of the president's fellow Republicans to call for an independent inquiry into links between the Trump administration team and the Russians. Our North America editor John Sopel reports. Donald Trump was today en route to the US Coast Guard Academy as his own administration seemed to be listing at a precarious angle. Our Commander in Chief, Donald Trump, thank you very much. This has been the most torrid week of this young presidency, and though he didn't address each individual setback, there was an unmistakable message. No politician in history, and I say this with great surety, has been treated worse or more unfairly. You can't let them get you down. I didn't get elected to serve the Washington media or special interests. I got elected to serve the forgotten men and women of our country, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> He's become more famous than me. <laughs> but forget the media. Far and away, his biggest problem comes from this man, the sacked FBI director, James Comey. The disclosure that he's kept detailed notes of all his meetings with the president, including over the sacked National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, is super serious. Donald Trump is reported to have said to Comey, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Comey is said to have replied, I agree, he's a good guy. Amid allegations that this amounted to obstruction of justice, last night the White House denied any wrongdoing, saying the president hadn't told the FBI director to stop his work. It brought this rejoinder from the Democratic leader on the floor of the Senate. The president says what Comey said was wrong. Prove it. It's easy to prove. As long as there are tapes or transcripts of what happened. If the president's right, he'll have no problem releasing memos, tapes, transcripts that corroborate his story. And other Democrats have started using the I word. I rise today, Mr. Speaker, to call for the impeachment of the President of the United States of America for obstruction of justice. This is not good for America. And some highly influential Republicans too are growing restive with comparisons being made to the dog days of Nixon. I think we've seen this movie before. I think it's reaching the point where 
It's of Watergate size and scale and a couple of other scandals that you and I have seen. It's been a calamitous week. Last Tuesday came the shock firing of James Comey, with the White House giving muddled explanations about why. Then on Friday, the president seemed to threaten his former FBI director with a tweet saying, James Comey better hope that there are no tapes of our conversations before he starts leaking to the press. And this Monday it emerged that the president divulged highly classified material to the Russian foreign minister when he visited the White House. But what about the mood outside Washington? Well, in the home of country and western, in Nashville, Tennessee, the Trump loyalists aren't changing tune. They're still singing, stand by your man. You cannot tell me that all these leaks and all these kinds of comments to the press that come through almost daily, almost hourly, are not because people are trying to subvert this president. The things they're saying about him and everything is total lie. All the media is are Democrats, they're all left-wingers. Um, they don't want to see him do well. Uh, they don't want to see America do well. They just want to give America away. The president who returned to the White House this evening will be buoyed by the support he continues to enjoy in the country. But that's what gets you elected, not what keeps you in power. And this administration can't afford any more weeks like the one that's just gone. And John is at the White House for us. Now, it has certainly been a very turbulent presidency so far, but how serious a moment is this for Donald Trump? Sophie, if you drew up a kind of league table of the allegations that have swirled around Donald Trump and looked at what was the most serious, I think that potentially the, this memo emerging from the former FBI director James Comey is the most serious. Like any good detective, he has kept contemporaneous notes of all his meetings uh, with Donald Trump. And if it was a court of law, that would be entirely admissible as evidence, the, the notes of an FBI person. So that presents a problem for Donald Trump. And some people are saying, well, he's going to be impeached now. Now, impeachment is for a start you've got to have a huge burden of proof but aside from that it has never happened in US history it not only has to pass the House of Representatives it then becomes a trial uh, in the Senate and you need a two-thirds majority for that to happen so that is still very very unlikely and it's still premature to talk about that but nevertheless this has been a torrid week as you said for the White House and You've seen members of staff there kind of feeling insecure about their jobs. The president has made a number of missteps. You see on Capitol Hill, the Republicans feeling very uncertain about the future. It has sometimes felt like we are going through a daily soap opera and improbable plot lines coming out. But what we're not yet at is the season finale that's still got a long way to go. Sophie. John Sopel in Washington. Thank you. The BBC understands that the Conservatives will promise additional measures to curb immigration when they publish their manifesto tomorrow. There will also be extra costs for employers who choose to hire non-EU immigrants to in skilled jobs. Let's talk to our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, who is in Westminster. And these are the first details that we are getting. What else are you hearing? They are, Sophie. And, of course, the publication of any manifesto is a big deal for a party leader, but particularly for Theresa May, because, of course, this is the first big document to come from the Conservative Party since she has been in charge. And it is her decision to call this election and her calculation that the ideas that she and her team will put forward will be enough to keep her on in Downing Street. And one of those first messages is an uncompromising one on immigration. It's their calculation that there was a clear instruction in the EU referendum from voters that immigration must come down. And Theresa May will say in terms tomorrow, in her view, immigration is too high. And she'll even suggest in her view, when immigration is too high, that has consequences for society. The question is, of course, then, well, what she's going to do about it. Because don't forget, as Home Secretary in charge for six years, she missed that target of bringing immigration down to under 100,000. Tomorrow, though, she will recommit to that figure. She will make that promise to the electorate again, that if elected under her leadership, immigration will come down to under 100,000. She will also say that student numbers will stay in those immigration figures, and there's been pressure on her to change that, arguments that it creates a false picture. But she will also propose extra charges for employers who bring in non-EU workers from around the world she will double the amount of money that they are expected to pay if they want to hire them. 
And there's also a suggestion that people from around the world, other than the EU, will have to pay more money to use the NHS during the time they're here. Now, there will be plenty more big ideas we hear on social care. But I think broadly, this is not going to be a manifesto that's full of hearts and flowers, Sophie. I think it's going to be quite a hard-headed document with Theresa May's ambition, her calculation, is that by saying to the country, I know there are problems that you want me to fix, she will come across as the leader that they believe can sort them. Laura Coonsberg in Westminster, thank you. Meanwhile, the Liberal Democrats have pledged to hold a second referendum on the final Brexit deal if they win the election. In their manifesto, which they launched today, the party promised to spend billions more on housing, education and the NHS. It would be funded in part by a penny increase on income tax. Other policies include the legislation of the legalization of cannabis and a future ban on sales of diesel cars and vans. Here's our political correspondent, Vicky Young. Even before he spoke, the platform was clear. Tim Farron wants this election to be about Brexit. And under the bright lights of a packed East London nightclub, the Lib Dem leader made his pitch to voters concerned about the consequences of leaving the EU. Someone is going to have the final say over the final Brexit deal. It could be the politicians or it could be the people. I believe it must be the people. But is his message getting through? I caught up with Mr Farron as he toured a school. Certainly there are many people in this country lacking hope. They think that the only thing on the table is Theresa May's bleak vision of us leaving the European Union with a, a hard Brexit. But there are also many people who voted Remain who now accept that result, something you're unwilling to do. And they feel, actually, we've just got to get on with it now. And many of them think Theresa May is the person to do that. So I think what there is out there is many people who feel like they've given up the fight. And what I'm saying to people is that I haven't. That if you believe that Britain's future is better alongside our neighbours in Europe, you should not be forced to accept a stitch up between Brussels and London. You should have the final say. The Liberal Democrat manifesto also promises £7 billion of extra investment in education in England, an increase in corporation tax and a penny rise in income tax to fund more spending on health in England, an end to the freeze on working age benefits and the party wants to legalise cannabis. There's no mention though of abolishing tuition fees in England, a policy the Lib Dems abandoned when they went into coalition with the Conservatives. Do you now accept tuition fees were the right thing to do and they're working? Well, you know, I voted against the rise in tuition fees. I think it's critically important that people keep their word. And that's why my advice to others is don't make promises that you cannot keep. But would you reverse heart, it now? Why not put reversing well, we, it? We've said we'd put uh, a significant additional money to returning grants to students to make sure that it's affordable. Here in southwest London, the Lib Dems are hoping for a comeback. The area voted overwhelmingly against Brexit. So how is their promise of another referendum going down with Remain voters? It's very childish to think just because you don't like a decision that's been made and that's been voted for, uh, that you can go back and reverse it or rearrange it. This is democracy, this is the country we live in and I think we should support that and stand by that, even though the decision wasn't one that I liked. I don't think that the fight should ever stop. I think it's far too important. I think it affects far too many lives. And um, yeah, we should carry on fighting until we have no other, you know, fight left in us. I was disappointed with the news about a potential referendum because I think that ship has sailed now and it's about trying to get the best kind of Brexit. And so how many seats do you need to gain for you to keep your job? My sense is that we need to increase our number of seats, increase our vote share, but what we need above all else is to offer the British people this one chance. This is the last chance saloon for Britain. If you believe Britain is open, tolerant and united, if you reject the extreme version of Brexit that Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn and UKIP have pushed through the House of Commons, if you reject that and want a better future, the Liberal Democrats are the only party offering you hope. Two years ago, the Lib Dems narrowly avoided election wipeout, but they're hoping the vote to leave the EU has thrown them a political lifeline. Vicky Young, BBC News, East London.
Well, the Lib Dems are hoping to attract young voters, not just with that pledge for another referendum on any Brexit deal, but also with a number of other policies concerning housing and the voting age. Our home editor, Mark Easton, has been to Cambridge, a key target seat for the Lib Dems, to see what young voters there are focusing on. We're here to talk to you about the election today. Let us know your thoughts and tweet us at Call Radio. The voice of the young, so often ignored by the politicians, it's loud and clear at Cambridge Regional College. This could be about anything such as Brexit, student tuition, student loans. Core Radio Cambridge broadcasts to thousands of potential young voters in the Liberal Democrats' number one target seat. So what's on their mind? I think politicians have to start appealing to young people because these young people are going to grow old. I think there's many things that need to be changed such as tuition, healthcare, NHS, it all needs to be different now and I think that a lot of people need to take the young people's opinions into consideration. The Lib Dem manifesto promises young people cheaper bus fares, higher welfare payments, help with housing and votes for 16 year olds. Is lowering the voting age the kind of policy that cuts it with these student hairdressers? A lot of people my age don't know enough about it and they kind of like they go with what their parents think and they're very influenced so I don't think it's a great idea to be mm. quite honest. Brexit's a big issue for you isn't yeah. it? Explain why. Well I'm a British citizen but my parents are Portuguese and so are the rest of my family. How do I know that nothing will happen to them and that they won't have to be going back to their country and then I'm just here? How now, the I Liberal Democrats that? are saying they want a, a much softer Brexit that's going to sort of retain access to the single market, free movement and so on. Is that appealing for someone like you? Well, I guess it's all talk. I don't know if it's going to be done. Political wisdom decrees that your manifesto should appeal to people who will actually vote. So the Liberal Democrats' focus on younger people is something of a risk. 18 to 24-year-olds are almost half as likely to vote as pensioners. This college has been encouraging students to register before next Monday's deadline, but cities with large student populations have been reporting a big drop in registrations. And there's a credibility issue for the Lib Dems. After promising not to put up university tuition fees in the 2010 election, they voted to do just that in government. Are the Lib Dems damaged goods now? I mean, I don't really remember when they put them up. Like, I was probably what, just finishing secondary school and stuff, so I didn't really pay big attention to it. Um, but for me, like knowing what they've done, I probably won't be able to trust them. I feel like they're stuck in a catch-22 because what they're giving is a mix between in the middle. Like They're not going to completely cut tuition fees, but they're going to offer a maintenance grant, which is great because as accessible as it should be, like everybody should be given the chance to go to uni. It's just silly now. So these are Lib Dem target voters in a Lib Dem target seat. I'm quite excited but nervous at the same time. So. For the party, a lot depends on how they respond to the promises of politicians. Mark Easton, BBC News, Cambridge. There are new warnings that workers are facing a squeeze on living standards. The latest figures indicate that wages are not keeping pace with the cost of living. However, another set of figures show that a record number of people are now in work. Here's our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. A business fair in Leeds and good news on jobs. Firms hiring plenty of people as economic growth remains positive. We're continually recruiting staff. We've, uh, we've grown really quickly over the last two years from four to 32 people. We've just employed at the moment our new part manager um, and we've also employed in the last couple of months a new ground staff. At this moment in time on our, on our company website I think we have 15 vacancies posted. The last time we saw unemployment this low was 1975 when the price of a pint of milk was a princely seven pence. It was also an era of high inflation and rapidly increasing incomes. Today, inflation is creeping back and incomes growth is falling. Let's look at the more recent history of pay and rising prices in Britain. If we go right back to the year 2000, you can see that earnings were consistently above the rate of inflation. On average, people were better off. That came to an abrupt halt in 2008 when the financial crisis hit. Wages fell sharply and inflation rose as things like the cost of petrol went up. That led to this long period of pay squeeze. And that didn't come to an end until September 2014. 
And until today, wages have stayed above the cost of living. But the gap has been closing. And today, those lines crossed. Individual incomes, on average, are going down again. Donna Spicer is a teaching assistant from South East London. She has faced a pay freeze for four years. I struggle to eat sometimes. We don't, I have no social life because of no money to go out. Um, and it's a choice of heating and eating. So one winter it was sitting there with blankets, hot water bottles, jackets, jumpers. Low unemployment used to mean higher wages as firms chased good workers. Higher inflation used to mean workers demanded increased pay rises. But people are still concerned about asking for a pay rise and the public sector pay freeze remains in place. Well, the big question for 2017 is whether wages respond to either of two big pressures. Those are fast rising inflation and very low unemployment. If they don't, we're likely to see the pay squeeze continue for some time and that's really concerning. Is there a spark for the UK economy? A way to produce more wealth from the hard hours we work? That relies on productivity going up. But the figures are down again. Until that problem is solved, the danger of a continued income squeeze remains. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. The number of child migrants and refugees travelling alone around the world has reached record numbers. The United Nations is warning that many of them are at risk of being exploited by smugglers and traffickers. In the past two years alone, at least 300,000 unaccompanied children were recorded in some 80 countries. 160,000 of them applied for asylum in Europe. Our correspondent Caroline Hawley has been to Greece, where she has been talking to children who have fled war and poverty. They had to cross through five different countries to get here. Three Afghan orphans now being looked after at a shelter in Athens. Hamid is 15, his brother Ali 13 and Mortaza 11. Their parents were killed in a Taliban bomb. The boys arrived here in March after a month-long journey, partly on foot, in the hands of smugglers. Hamid says they now want to join their 18-year-old brother in Sweden. How difficult was the journey? What was the hardest part? With so many migrants now stuck in Greece, there's not space in proper shelters for all the unaccompanied children. And there are stories of teenagers being forced to work for no pay or prostituting themselves for pocket money. One in ten of the children who've arrived in Greece travelled alone. These Syrian brothers told me their parents had sent them to Europe to avoid them being conscripted. It's very dangerous to stay in Syria because uh, they, they're taking a lot of children like us from the age uh, 16 to the war, to fighting. In the shelter they live in, 21 teenagers are learning how to play again. The man in charge of the refuge fled Iran as a child himself and is now a psychologist. All these kids have psychological difficulties. They have sleep problems, aggressiveness, self-harm, not wanting to eat or be around other people. Some of them will be scarred for life by what they've been through. And the UN says that record numbers of children are now on the move around the world without their parents, driven from their countries by conflict and desperation. Much more must be done, it says, to protect them. Caroline Hawley, BBC News, Athens. A brief look at some of the day's other news stories now. And a council has been ordered to pay nearly £200,000 to a former member of staff who was sexually abused by a council official. Richard Rowe, who's waived his right to anonymity, successfully sued Sheffield City Council after being assaulted by Roger Dodds in the early 1980s. Dodds, who's 81, was imprisoned in February for a series of assaults. 
A lawyer for Ian Brady has made clear that the ashes of the Moors murderer who died on Monday will not be scattered on Saddleworth Moor in Greater Manchester where most of his victims were buried. The assurance came during a coroner's court hearing this afternoon in Southport. The Irish Prime Minister, Enda Kenny, has announced he will stand down next month when his party, Fine Gael, elects a new leader to take over. He led the country through the economic crisis, but his position was weakened after last year's election, which resulted in a minority coalition government. The former American soldier Chelsea Manning, who was behind one of the biggest intelligence leaks in US history, has been released from military prison. The 29-year-old was expected to remain in jail until 2045, but President Obama commuted her sentence just before he left the White House in January. Our correspondent, Regina Vardanathan, reports from Kansas. Chelsea Manning, seen here in her final days behind bars. Held in an all-male prison, she won her fight to have surgery, to transition to life as a woman. As she stepped out to a new life, she shared photos of the everyday things she's missed, like pizza. In a statement, she said she was looking forward to so much. Chelsea Manning left the military prison here at Fort Leavenworth in the early hours of this morning under the cover of darkness. Her supporters say she's a whistleblower and a hero. But in the past, Donald Trump's called her an ungrateful traitor. And that's a view shared by many people I've spoken to near the base here who believe her actions put many lives at risk. It was while she was living as Bradley Manning that she was convicted of one of the largest leaks of government information in US history. A low-ranking army private in Iraq, Manning hacked government databases, handing hundreds of thousands of classified documents to the WikiLeaks organisation. It included this video of a US Apache helicopter strike in Iraq, Come on, let us shoot. which killed civilians and journalists, and diplomatic cables, which revealed the private thoughts of US officials. WikiLeaks uh, had very significant impacts in certain countries uh, for a variety of reasons. It did not necessarily have the global impact that we had initially feared. Uh, but Chelsea Manning put you know, real American interests and real lives, you know, at risk. We are Supporters have been campaigning for her release for years. They say she faced discrimination in prison because of her transgender identity, which she revealed shortly after her sentencing. She's learned how to live with her situation as it was because she thought she was going to be there for a long time. And now she's ready to get out and, more importantly, she's ready to finally be able to live as the woman that she is. For now, Chelsea Manning will remain a member of the US military without pay as she appeals her conviction. Well, Chelsea Manning's release has been met with a mixed reception and it's still unclear what she'll do with her newfound freedom. Her friends say she could take on a very public role as a campaigner for transgender rights. In the seven years that she spent behind bars, society has changed quite a bit. For example, transgender people are now allowed to serve openly in the US military. Regini, thank you. More on the election campaign now and the latest in our series looking at the new shape of politics in the UK. It's now three years since Scotland chose to remain a part of the United Kingdom. Tonight, our special correspondent, Alan Little, reports on how the principal fault line in this election campaign still seems to be the matter of independence. There's new energy in the Scottish Conservative Party. For 20 years, they'd all but disappeared from the electoral map. Now they're ahead of Labour as the second party of Scotland. Why? Strong and stable leadership is not front and centre stage here. It's the union that dominates their campaign message. People are leaving Labour and coming to us because we are the party of the union um, and it's the party you can put your trust in. The second independence referendum was the issue that motivated me to join the Conservative Party and to take an active part in, you know, the uh, election campaign. Yeah, as soon as you yeah. go door, start door knocking, they start, the first thing they want to talk about, um, it's supposed to be local issues, and then it becomes very, very much about the independence referendum, it's all they want to talk about. It is the number one issue in Scotland. Until recently, general elections in Scotland were about the same question as in the rest of the country, namely, who do you want to govern Britain? And for 50 years, Scotland's answer to that question was Labour. The independence referendum of 2014 realigned Scottish politics. Now the question is not so much who do you want to govern Britain, 
but do you want to be in Britain at all? In the 20th century, Scots were devoted unionists, bound into the UK by the great shared enterprises of empire, the Second World War and the post-war welfare state. The nationalised industries, coal, steel, shipbuilding, were bedrocks not just of Labour loyalty, but of British identity in Scotland. Miners in Fife were part of a community of shared interest with miners in Yorkshire and South Wales. The deindustrialization of the 1980s and 90s brought down these powerful pillars of Britishness in Scotland. For much of the 20th century, Dundee was a Labour fortress. In 2014, it became Yes City, voting for independence by the largest margin in the country. So I've been kind of falling out of love with Labour for a long time. That experience pushed many traditional Labour voters to the SNP. Jane Phillips was among them. She believes independence is inevitable. The idea is there, and it's like, it's like trying to unknow something. You can't unknow it, and now that idea is out there. You know, there is a the move towards it. It's like, think of all the other countries in the world who've got their independence. Uh, think about the British Empire. It's once this notion of independence was out there, it was a, an inexorable move towards it. You can't unknow that idea of taking control of your, um, your own future. <laughs> Does the Conservative revival mean that the independence tide has turned? In some ways, the Conservative resurgence uh, seems to suggest that actually the constitutional issue matters more, perhaps more than it ever has, because it's the Conservative Party more than any other party that are talking about independence and the threat of independence, and that helps them, they feel it's helped them, to be the party of choice for those who are uh, first and foremost in favour of Scotland remaining in the United Kingdom. The Conservatives and the SNP together have changed Scottish politics. The fault line is not so much left versus right. Independence for or against is what divides Scotland now. Alan Little, BBC News, Edinburgh. Now, they are known as bots, fake profiles created on social media which are then used to post millions of automated messages. They're increasingly being used to spread propaganda, sometimes by foreign powers and often without us knowing who's behind them. Today, the Information Commissioner said she would launch a formal investigation into the way political campaigns use new digital tools to win votes, as our media editor Amol Rajan explains. This is the moment in crime thriller Homeland when bots, or fake personalities online, are put to work. Vacation's over. You'll find a new set of talking points in your folders. Get outraged. Let's go! But the threat that they pose to democracy is fast becoming fact, not fiction. Researchers at the Oxford Internet Institute witnessed a huge explosion in the use of bots around the US election last year. But what are they exactly? A bot's basically a bit of software that automates uh, human activity online. The question is, how can you tell the difference between a bot and a real person? What I'm showing you here is an account on Twitter that uh, says that it was f started in July 2015, but it already has 266,000 tweets. That's a lot. That's a lot of tweets. It looks like it's tweeting on a really particular schedule. So. It says four hours, four hours, four hours. All of the tweets are coming up within minutes of one another when we're looking at it here. And what that shows us is that is a couple things. One, that it's tweeting much more regularly than a person could. And two, that it's tweeting on a very particular schedule. There are fears bots could be used to influence Britain's forthcoming general election. Many experts believe Russia has already used bots to target the French and US elections, a claim Russia denies. Leading academics say bots are degrading the truth by spreading misinformation online. There are users who can't distinguish between a message that comes from their friends or their family and a message that comes from a bot. And in a close election where you need 2 or 3 percent of the popular vote to, to make a difference, to push you over the edge, having an automated campaign that can get you those voters who are a little uncertain or don't quite know Getting those, those small numbers of voters to believe a lie about your opponent is a sensible strategy. Bots are a 21st century form of propaganda. The question is whether the law and public awareness have kept pace with new technology. 
And while extremists and foreign powers use bots to influence elections and change our behaviour, it's only now that we're waking up to the threat. Bots will form part of a formal investigation announced today by the Information Commissioner. She'll report later this year on how personal data is being captured and exploited for political purposes. I think there needs to be public awareness. Somebody needs to pull back the curtain and look behind the scenes to see how all of this data may be mashed up, may be linked and may be used to push people in a certain direction. There has to be transparency around that. That's what the law says. But it's not yet clear how to protect British voters from bots. Without strong defences in place, they could undermine the very idea of democracy in our time. Amal Rajan, BBC News. And that is all from us here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Good night.